few months ago, I read a story in the local newspaper.、Uh, reporters had left letters on the street. All around the city, and they wanted to see how many letters were returned to the mailbox. So they wanted to see how kind people in Helsinki really are towards each other. And it was a really cool experiment. A lot of the letters were put into the mailbox, so people were kind and friendly towards each other. But what sort of struck me was the headline of the story, because it read something along the lines of a surprising amount of letters were returned to the mailbox. And this got me thinking: Why are we surprised when people act kindly? Why is it surprising that people help each other? And why do we expect the worst from each other?、Um, so, in light of this, I might have a slightly difficult task ahead of me tonight, because I'm going to try to convince you that people are actually inherently generous. Uh, inherently friendly、uh, and inherently kind towards each other. Now we do have very good reason、uh, to kind of expect the worst from each other、uh, on days like this, and、uh, in general on a day-to-day -day basis, we're faced with evidence and stories about human、uh, hatred, human animosity, and human greed. Which maybe leads us to conclude that humans are wolves to humans, and accept this as a fundamental truth about human nature. But I suggest that、uh, this evening, even just for the next ten、uh, minutes or so, we take a small vacation from this story about human nature, and visit another story that is quite different, but I propose equally true.、Um, And why don't we even start with the wolves? Because <laughs> wolves aren't selfish. Wolves aren't mean. First of all, they're super cute, <laughs> and they're pack animals. Wolves work together. They need to collaborate in order to survive. They hunt together. They share food. They routinely make decisions that benefit others、uh, instead of only themselves.、Um, and you know what? Humans are pack animals too. It has been suggested that the only reason we still exist as a species is because we are able to collaborate, because we're able to share, because we like helping each other and being kind. And perhaps as a result, our brains host a wide array of mechanisms that are devoted for connecting to other people, for understanding other people on the level of thoughts and on the level of feelings. For example, we have brain mechanisms that make emotions super contagious. <laughs> they've done these studies where they put a person in the brain scanner, and then they show them terrible pictures of someone like cutting their finger with scissors or stubbing their toe painfully. And what happens is that the pain areas of the person viewing these pictures light up, which means、uh, that in some situations, in some contexts. Our brains don't understand that we are two different people, <laughs> and that your pain is exactly the same as my pain, which to me is a super beautiful thought. We also have、uh, several mechanisms in the brain that have kind of rigged us for kindness, that have rigged us to enjoy helping each other and being kind.、Um, and it's、uh, these mechanisms that I intend to speak about at a greater length this evening. Because I believe that understanding these mechanisms might create more opportunities for us to utilize them, to create opportunities for kindness to emerge. So I'm going to talk about three studies that I find super interesting, that kind of shed light on what it is to be kind or the neural basis of kindness. The first one explains、uh, what kind of、um, place kindness has in our minds, what kind of place it has in in basic human nature. The second study tells a story about、um, what happens in the brain when we act kindly, and the third、uh, study tells about why, <laughs> answers to the question why, what what motivates people to act kindly, why do we choose、uh, to kind of work for the good of others, perhaps at a cost to our to ourselves. So onto the first piece of evidence. It's this study conducted by fantastically talented researchers, who were interested in what happens to people when they're not able to control themselves. 
So researchers wanted to know like, uh, what types of animal impulses arise when people aren't able to control themselves or inhibit these impulses. How do we behave towards each other when there is no self-control? So in order to answer this question, they sort of um, shut down the parts of the brain that are responsible for self-control. And they had the participants play a game where they could distribute money to others. Now, what they found was uh, that the participants who were no longer able to inhibit themselves became more generous towards others, towards strangers. Uh, now, if you stop to think about this result for a moment, um, it's actually pretty beautiful. And the researchers stated that it might mean that generosity, the willingness to share, is the default state of the human brain that this is how we're wired in a fundamental way, and that if we want to act selfishly, this is what self-control is needed for, to stave off our natural selfless impulses. My second piece of evidence is here. <laughs> in this study, researchers want to know what happens in our brains when we decide to act kindly. So they had participants, and they split them into two groups. Uh, they give both groups of uh, uh, both uh, participants gr both groups of participants a certain sum of money, and they were meant to spend the sum of money during the next four weeks. They had one group act selfishly or promise to act selfishly and spend all the money on themselves. Then they had the selfless group who made a promise to spend the money only on other human beings. Uh, and after they made this promise, they took the participants and put them in the brain scanner where they could play a game where they could either make selfish or selfless decisions. Now, what they found was that immediately after deciding to act either selfishly or selflessly, um, there were differences in how, how people made these decisions in the task, task that they were doing in the brain scanner. So the people who had just made a promise to help others, to give all the money to others, to buy others things, also made more selfless decisions in the task they did in the scanner. They also reported increased feelings of happiness <laughs> as a result of the decision. And furthermore, when they made selfless decisions in the brain scanner, the parts of the brain that are important for feelings of reward and pleasure became active. So it means that by creating a kind mindset, you promote kind behavior instantly, and, and your brain starts rewarding you for it. So it's like this beautiful loop that you can create just by, by uh, assuming a kind mindset and acting kindly towards others. My last and final piece of evidence <laughs> about the selfless uh, nature of human beings is this one. And here, scientists were interested in the question of why do we act kindly towards others when it often comes at a cost to ourselves? Why do we choose to help others? And generally, it's thought that there are two main reasons why people help others. Number one is fairness. So someone does something kind to me and then I pay back. I'm kind to you, so I reciprocate. And number two is empathy. So when I see someone else in pain, it causes personal distress, and I do decide to do something kind to kind of resolve the situation. Now, in this study, scientists were interested in whether this is true, whether we have these two roots to kind actions, and whether the mechanisms that uh, create these motives are somehow separate in the brain. So in order to investigate this, scientists had to, of course, cause or generate feelings of either fairness or empathy in the participants. And they did this by dividing the participants into two groups. They had the fairness group and the empathy group. And uh, then they induced feelings of either fairness or empathy with the help of electric shocks. It's very easy. <laughs> Perhaps also speak something about the kindness of the experimenters. <laughs> Allow me to explain. Uh, so if you were in the, in the empathy group, um, they took you into a room, or the participant into a room with two other people who were in on the plan. And the participant sat there, and one of the pe persons was shocked with terribly painful electric shocks. The participant herself was shocked with moderately painful electric shocks, and the third person wasn't shocked at all. 
So the idea was that seeing someone in pain <laughs> and, and knowing what that pain feels like would cause me to experience feelings of empathy towards the person in pain. Very efficient. Now, in the fairness group, <laughs> the situation was similar. So there were two people alongside the participant in a room, but now the participant was super unlucky because they were the ones getting the most painful electric shocks. <laughs> Um, another person was getting only moderately painful electric shocks, and a third person really no shocks at all. Them. And the trick to induce fairness here was that uh, the person getting the moderately painful shocks could save the participant from getting shocked by giving up some of their own money. So the thought was that when this person keeps saving me from getting those shocks, I'll see them as a really fair, fair person. Okay. Are you with me? <laughs> so we have two groups. We have the empathy group and the fairness group. In the empathy group, participants are feeling empathy towards someone in pain. In the fairness group, they're being treated fairly by another person. Okay, then the participants were put into a brain scanner, and the task was to divide a sum of money between the three people. So you could either keep all the money to yourself, or give some to the other people who just who you just uh, spent some excruciating minutes with in the room. And perhaps not surprisingly, in the empathy group, uh, the participants decided to give more money to the person they empathized with, the person they'd seen in pain. And in the fairness group, the participants decided to give more money to the person who had treated them fairly. And it seemed that these two mechanisms, mechanisms were somehow separate in the brain that there are several routes to kindness in our brain. But what if you're just like a, like a selfish person? <laughs> what if you were given the choice of uh, like, uh, dividing a pot of money between the three people and go like, well, of course I'll keep it all to myself. <laughs> well, in this study, the scientists identified highly selfish people and they wanted to see, is there any way that we can get these people to act kindly? And it turns out that empathy still does the trick. So if you're a super selfish person, uh, being treated fairly doesn't really do anything. You don't feel the need to pay back, but empathy still works. So our brains have found a way to circumvent these, these obstacles to kindness, which to me speaks about how surprisingly resilient and powerful kindness is. It finds a way to emerge in interaction. And perhaps the more important take-home message from this particular study is that these things I've been speaking about, like fairness and kindness and empathy, they are not individual traits. So they're not individual characteristics, but they emerge, they exist in interaction. So the really cool thing then is that kindness and fairness and empathy have the chance to emerge in any interaction. It's a matter of choice. And as participants of any interaction, you and I can choose whether we wish to nurture these characteristics or not. So perhaps in, in summary, uh, faced with all of the evidence of, of human nature, uh, faced with all the, the news and all the scientific evidence, I don't think we're left with one truth or certainty about who we are, what we are like as a species, but rather a choice, a choice to act. Uh, we can either choose to listen to only the stories that speak about the selfish nature of human beings, or we can also listen to other types of evidence. We can also choose to see evidence of uh, how we are wired for kindness. And the very cool question is, what happens on the level of our actions as a result of this choice? Um, what happens on the level of our feelings as a result of this choice? And most importantly, could we create more opportunities for kindness to emerge through rightful recognition of its place in human nature? Thank you. Thank you.